Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to the Pound This Podcast. This is episode 763, Diet for Great Sex. Row, with Christine Delosier. <laughs> so as the title of this episode says, we do discuss sex, sexual themes. We don't get raunchy or nothing crazy, but if there are sensitive ears listening and you don't want to hear about that topic or the people that may be listening with you don't want to hear that topic, this is your disclaimer that we talk about sexy things and the foods to eat to help enhance those sexy times. <laughs> so before we get to that episode, I do want to tell you about my sexy friend, Sarah, and Team Fit With Me. Sarah is a fantastic health coach. She has an entire team with her, including Jeanette, who is her mindset coach, who I've been working with for the past few months. She is absolutely freaking phenomenal. So if you're looking for a coach that's going to help you maybe run some labs, that's how I found out I have Hashimoto's disease with Sarah and the blood work that we ran and help you with hormones, learning all about nutrition, counting math macros, figuring all that stuff out, exercise plans, all of it, mindset, everything <laughs> that comes with, you know, health and fitness and nutrition. Sarah has got your back. And if you want 10% off month one of all packages and plans, go to teamfitwithme.com slash pound this. You'll find that link in the show notes. I want to lose weight, but I don't know how to get started. What should I meal prep every week? How do I get those sweet booty gains? Inspiration for your healthy lifestyle. The Pound This Podcast with Amanda Valentine. Thank you so much for listening to the Pound This Podcast. I am Amanda Valentine. Very excited to chat with my guest today all about food and sex. My goodness. I mean, there's how can we go wrong in this conversation? <laughs> it's Christine Delosier. How are you? I'm doing just fine, Amanda. Um, thank you so much for having me as a guest on your show. And um, I have to tell you, when I saw the name of your podcast, <laughs> I thought it was a sex podcast. I'm like, oh, pound this. Yeah, okay, this is this is going to be right up my alley. They're pretty brazen here, but yeah, okay. Let's go, you know? <laughs> right? That's so funny. Well, it's, I mean, I, I make the joke all the time that I'm like, my, I'm like my, my podcast is called Pound This. I'm like, it's not about porn, but it can be for the right price. <laughs> Everybody likes talking about sex, right? So, right. You know. And that's where it's like even like my Instagram name is You Can Pound This, which even sounds even more <laughs> like a porn bot. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've definitely discussed sexual wellness before, definitely diet, health, exercise, all of the above. And um, it's funny that the email I got from you mentioned that too of like, okay, the, your podcast is called Pound This. How can we not talk about sex? I'm like, you're correct. <laughs> we do have to talk about this. So you have a book that uh, I find fascinating which is diet for great sex and so I guess before we get into the book and we talk about diet for great sex which yes give me all the details tell me like how did you get here to get into this spot to write this book what's your background what have you studied uh, let's start at the beginning and end up to where we are now sure so I am a licensed acupuncturist in private practice specializing in sexual health um, but long before that, I trained to be a research scientist at the University of Rochester. And um, so I kind of brought that into the, the whole book thing. You know, that's where, you know, the, the whole book is focused on what the scientific evidence is to show the relationship between what we eat and sex, you know, great sex, uh, sexual function. Um, so I didn't always specialize in sexual health. I uh, actually, you know, when I graduated from acupuncture school, I, I treated back pain and neck pain, headaches, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that acupuncturists treat. And I just happened to have um, a patient come in and he said, could you help me have stronger erections? And I said, well, let's give it a whirl. You know, I haven't treated this much. And he had such good results and he came back. He was so happy. It made such a difference for him and his wife. And I ended up having a few patients after that who had really great results. So very early on in my private practice, I just moved towards specializing in sexual health. Um, I've, you know, as far as my training, I have uh, a few master's degrees in, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, um, acupuncture, um, counseling. I have a certificate in uh, holistic um, nutritional consultation. I've studied traditional Chinese dietary therapy. 
And again, I was a research scientist, or I studied to be, I trained to be a research scientist. I ended up not following a, a career in it, but I kind of brought that to the table. So you put all of those things together, plus my love of food. I'm a big foodie. And there you have what kind of brought me here before you today. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So like, where did you start making the correlations between what we eat and how that affects our sex life? Well, you know, I, 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 I just assumed that it did um, based on, you know, my, my belief that pretty much, um, you know, good health stems from uh, treating our bodies in accordance with the biological design of them. And so I would often ask my patients, okay, what do you eat? Um, you know, my book was an attempt to just kind of prove what I already knew, which was, you know, um, the, the, the foundation of great sex exists in, you know, certain structures and certain processes within the body. So when we think about great sex, we think, you know, the right partner, the right mood, the right situation, but in our bodies, great sex is when our nerves are firing strong, rapid signals to and from our genitals. It's when our blood vessels are delivering adequate blood flow, and it's when our sex hormones are balanced and optimized. And um, the science shows that uh, food very much affects this entire trifecta of great sex, if you will. You know, so if you take, for example, just one example, leafy greens. Um, these, you know, benefit that whole trifecta of great sex. You know, other foods like, you know, greasy processed foods work against it. You know, some of these foods can stiffen blood vessels in a matter of, you know, hours after eating them. Uh, and over the long haul, they, they measurably stiffen and deliver less blood flow. They sabotage sex hormones, you know, all the refined sugars in our diets, for example. Um, but leafy greens, for example, helps all these things. So in research, uh, spinach, for example, was shown to help optimize testosterone. And the way it does this is by reducing cortisol. So when cortisol is high, cortisol is a stress hormone. And uh, in our modern society, we have so many demands placed on us. Who's not stressed out? Who's not operating with these really high cortisol levels? Um, and that sabotages testosterone. That's important for female bodies as well as male bodies. It's not just for, for, for guys. So um, then, uh, so the, the leafy greens reduce cortisol levels and then boost testosterone, which is going to make for better libido, better overall sexual um, health in general. Leafy greens are one of the best things that we can eat for blood flow and for cardiovascular health. What they do is they soften the delicate lining of blood vessels and making them more elastic and able to deliver more blood flow. And if you think that's just important for erections, let me tell you, it is not. Um, blood flow is important for females as well. The better our blood flow is, the better sensitivity we have in the clitoris and vagina, and the um, easier time we have um, achieving orgasm. So, um, so it's important for everybody to have blood flow. It's important for, you know, arousal, for lubrication, for strong erections, of course. And, um, yeah, leafy greens just, you know, they have, they're, they kind of, uh, address cardiovascular health with numerous nutrients. It's not just one, one way. They have a whole lot going on with, with regard to that. They're high in antioxidants too, which have been shown in research to actually, speed and strengthen nerve conduction. What that means is that all those signals of pleasure when our partner's touching us or when we're engaged in the moment are stronger. They're faster. What what that means is so sorry. Oh you're cool. So sorry. <laughs> sorry, I usually I usually turn off my phone and I, I overlooked it. But okay. we can just pick up. Yep. What that means is uh okay. What that means is more pleasure, stronger pleasure signals, better erections, better lubrication, and all of those things. So these three components all work together to make for great sex. And um, what you know, again, that's just one example of many, many foods and dietary habits that we can, you know, take on and adopt into our daily lives just to make for better sex. So if we're making a grocery list here and we've got leafy greens on the list, check. That's number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the first one. <laughs> what, what else are we putting on the list? Um, well, you know, that's that's a huge one. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to say said. that's probably my favorite. There's lots of them that we can talk about, but that's like my favorite because, you know, we've we've kind of gone astray 
you know, the human species has, you know, gotten off the wagon in terms of what we should be eating. I mean, think about it. Other animals know exactly what to eat, right? They go right for the right plant or animal. They know what best nourishes their health instinctively. We, on the other hand, we look around and ask each other what we should eat, you know, and we have all these conflicting opinions on what we should eat. You know, if you look at other primates, you know, other species that are close, you know, uh, genetically to human beings, like chimpanzees, for example, and other, um, other primates, you see they sit around eating leaves all the time. You know, all day long, they eat tons and tons of leaves. They have great sex, and they get many times the amount of, you know, potassium, calcium, magnesium, all these things that, that we kind of lack in our diets, and, and that's, so that's important. So leafy greens is a huge one. You know, well, let's put that, like, way up here. Um, you know, if you think about something like potassium-rich foods, that's something that we sorely neglect in our diet. I read a study recently that 97% of Americans don't get enough potassium, and this is such a shame and it's a shame for your partner, too, because it makes for way better sex. So human beings, we used to take in about 10 times as much potassium in our diets as sodium. Now, with our incredibly processed diets, we take in about 10 times as much sodium as potassium. And our bodies, in order to deal with all that excess sodium, on top of us not getting enough to begin with, have to flush potassium. Our kidneys have to flush potassium in order to deal with all that salt because it's actually more than is considered uh, suitable for human consumption or fit for human consumption. It's like a lot. It's way more than we should be we should be eating. And you know what that does is it wreaks havoc on our blood vessels. It causes what's called calcifications of our blood vessels. It stiffens them. It just brings less blood flow. It um, you know makes for just poor cardiovascular health. Lots of studies show that when we can bring some more cal uh, some more potassium into our diets. So, for example, in one study, they had uh, participants add a baked potato with the skin, because about 40% of the potassium is in the skin, and two bananas to their diets every single day. And they, what they did is they actually measure how well their, their arteries operate. They measure how much blood flow. Um, they measure how elastic they are. They measure basically how suitable they are to... Um, to deliver blood flow. And they have measurable improvements in a very short amount of time after um, changing their diets. So that's another one. Another big one is potassium. It's something that people don't really uh, think much about. When we think about a healthy diet, we focus a lot of times on, uh, we focus on calories, we focus on vegetables, certainly, but there's not a huge list of things that have a lot of potassium. We have to actually make a conscious effort to include more of that in our diets. Well, what's unfortunate, too, with, like, you know, thinking of, like, bananas, that they have such a bad rap in diet culture now, too. People are so anti-banana because of, like, sugar content or starch, and so we have this weird fear of eating bananas whenever it's good for us in so many ways. It's, it's strange how certain things kind of get demonized whenever it's like, it, this is a plant. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know... Um, the, the other thing about a lot of these potassium rich foods is that they're carby, you know, they're very, they're heavy in carbs. I mean, the only ones, if you, if you're on keto, for example, or if you're on like low carb diet, you have to eat a lot of leafy greens because leafy greens have potassium, but it's like, if you eat a big, huge salad, you're getting about 20% of your daily potassium. You have to get it in other ways. Usually um, a banana has about 20%, you know, a baked potato with the skin has about 20%, but most of these foods have a lot of carbs in them. Yeah. So if you're not eating a lot of carbs, you really got to like do, you know, go way extra on the leafy greens because um, otherwise you're not, you're definitely not going to be um, getting enough for, you know, good sex. So we have the leafy greens and we have the potassium. What else is on the grocery list? Um, well, we know one of my favorites is, um, antioxidants. Like we've been beat over the head with this message of how good antioxidants are. <clears throat> you know, everything you read talks about antioxidants and there's a reason for it. There, you know, it's, there's so much research just showing how good they are for our blood vessels, for our nerves. And we talked about, um, nerve conduction. One of the best ways to improve those pleasure signals, um, are increasing antioxidants. So, you know, we can get that through our leafy greens again. We can get that through berries. We can get that through a lot of the, you know, colored vegetables and things, colored fruits. 
Um, one of my favorite ways to incorporate that is through mushrooms, but they're not just good for antioxidants. Mushrooms kind of bring a whole lot to the table and they're really worth kind of, a, you know, incorporating into our diets. Um, first of all, they're loaded with antioxidants. So they're going to strengthen and speed those pleasure signals, um, make for, you know, better blood flow. They're great for the cardiovascular system. But the coolest thing of all about mushrooms is the way that they benefit all these systems of great sex. It's really fascinating. I was reading, there are a lot of studies on this and there's a growing body of research on this is they actually improve the microbiome, which is crazy. You know, it's, it's like it's so cool. So different mushrooms um, affect different populations of microbes in our digestive tract and therefore have a different effect. Um, so, but even like your white button mushrooms that you get from the grocery store uh, were shown in research to improve the biodiversity of our um, microbiome. So our microbiome is the, you know, this balance of um, bacteria and other microorganisms in our digestive tract. And, um, you know, a greater amount of attention has been focused on it lately because they're finding out that pretty much all aspects of health really are affected by this balance, um, even things you wouldn't think about. So for example, there was this one study where they had these mice that were uh, had high risk of cardiovascular disease. What they did was then they took a healthy group of mice and they did a fecal transplant. They transferred the feces of these high-risk cardiovascular mice into the digestive tract of the um, healthy mice, and they too developed high risk of cardiovascular disease. So just by changing that balance of all those microbes, um, they shifted their risk of cardiovascular disease, which most people don't, you know, we don't think about that have, having any association, right? Right. Yeah, it's just so interesting of like how much food does for us when we've been so trained to just think of like weight loss or what it does for us aesthetically and not thinking of how it's changing our microbiome or even just like affecting our sex life. Like you're not hearing these conversations around leafy greens and baked potatoes and mushrooms in that sort of sense. And then hearing of like all of these amazing things, these foods do for us. I'm also assuming by thinking mushrooms, you're probably not also like drowning that and de like deep frying them. <laughs> no, you know, you don't need to though with mushrooms. I mean, um, you can, you know, <laughs> you can, they taste pretty good. Like I have this one recipe for mushrooms that we have every year for Christmas. It's like, you know, loads of butter, you know, like a bottle of wine, you know, a pound of salt. It's like just everything that you can imagine and tastes really good. But you know, you can saute mushrooms with very little or n no oil even and put them on top of anything. If you have, you know, fish, you can put them on top of fish. If you have them, you know, on potatoes, you can put them on top of potatoes. You can pretty much throw them on top of anything and it kind of adds a nice flavor. I made a uh, soup. I throw them in there. I throw them in my sauce. I throw all kinds of mushrooms in my sauce and it tastes really good. I make a nice homemade sauce. Um, you know, like a Sunday sauce, I throw even some lion's mane mushrooms in them. I throw some oyster mushrooms in some white button, some, you know, shiitake and it tastes really good. I mean, it, it doesn't add a weird flavor to it at all. So these are the foods that we should be adding to our diet. Is, what, is there anything specifically we need to avoid? Yeah. Yeah, there are. There's a good amount of research on this too. So salt is one. I mean, obviously we need salt. We crave salt because in nature, we don't find, you know, salt in abundance. Um, we, now that we have table salt though, it's in everything. So we get so much more than we need. And in research, um, a salty meal stiffened blood vessels within 30 minutes of eating it. And of course, in the long term, just like we talked about, it just wreaks havoc on, on blood vessels. Then there's um, greasy, fatty, um, you know, a, a diet of greasy, fatty foods, even in the short term, though. So a high fat, uh, like a really greasy meal will stiffen blood vessels measurably within two hours of eating it. So that's why I, in my book, I have like a date night sex menu. And that's all the foods that we should be eating right before sex and the foods that we should be avoiding right before sex, because some foods actually measurably improve blood flow so like leafy greens that's why a lot of athletes um, do pre-workouts or they um, you know that, that have high nitrate content like beets or leafy greens because they dilate blood vessels in the short term 
And uh, potassium rich foods are another one that, that dilate blood vessels in the short term. Um, they improve the elasticity in the short term. Um, polyphenol rich foods like berries and apples are another one for a date night sex menu because of their effect on, on blood flow. But then there are foods that will, you know, kind of in the short term also uh, dump testosterone. So a, a greasy meal will dump testosterone. A very sugary meal, anything that spikes your blood sugar is going to drop testosterone, which is not what you want for your date night. Um, and then in the long term, refined sugar is actually sabotage sex hormones because they cause like insulin resistance. They cause leptin resistance, which is the hormone that tells us when we're full. And that then leads to disruptions in testosterone and estrogen, which is going to make, you know, it's going to throw off our sex drive and blood flow. And it throws off all those other kind of pieces of great sex. So, um, in short, um, you know, greasy, salty, sugary foods are, you know, kind of stay away from those. And especially in the short term, um, on the other hand, though, so in research, a high omega-3 fatty meal actually had the opposite effect on blood vessels in the short term. So in like that two hour window after eating. So if you eat a piece of like wild salmon or some walnuts, for example, both of which have a really nice omega-3 profile that actually um, improved arterial function in that two hour window after eating them. So they're add you know, can add that to your date night sex menu. So what about foods that, like, I've kind of classically heard are, like, aphrodisiacs, like oysters. Is that a real thing? You know, there's a little bit of research showing that that's true, um, just a little bit. You know, I have a whole chapter on aphrodisiacs in my book, and I tried to include everything that had some research. Having said that, you know, the research isn't that strong. You know, we have, like, usually a few studies for each of the things that I included in there. Um but that's not to say that that they're they should be completely discredited. If you take an oyster, first of all, it's got a, one single oyster has about fifty percent of your daily zinc, and zinc's a huge player in sexual health, and it's a huge player in testosterone production. So um, that's probably how it gets its reputation as an aphrodisiac. There are some foods that actually have a lot more research, like uh, saffron. So saffron. It has been shown in research to um, increase how often people have sex, um, increase sexual satisfaction, um, bump up testosterone, all sorts of things. And there, there are a lot of um, even culinary aphrodisiacs that have been shown in research to give a little bump to testosterone. But again, it's usually like just one or two studies. So, you know, um, you got to kind of take it with a grain of salt, but it can be kind of fun to experiment with. I mean, you know, not not go overboard. You don't want to kind of go in excess of any of those things. But um, yeah, it's, it can be fun to to try to incorporate those, make a nice meal of, you know, lots of aphrodisiac rich foods. You know, you have your date night sex menu. You've got your high potassium acorn squash. You throw some aphrodisiac nutmeg on there. You throw some aphrodisiac cloves on there and, you know, go to town. That sounds awesome. <laughs> no, <I'm hungry. laughs> so is there a difference between the foods that we're eating between men and women? I mean, we're so different. Anyway, it would make sense that we're going to have different you know, effects to the foods that we eat. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, though, is that the dietary recommendations are not different between um, men and women or males and females, rather. Um, Though we, we have uh, different optimal um, sex hormone ratios as far as sex goes. So for the best sex, males do better with higher levels of testosterone, but estrogen is also important. Um, for females, higher levels of estrogen, but testosterone is also important. It's so important, in fact, that um, you know some women have sought um, testosterone you know, in order to help uh, improve libido, for example. So another question I have, too, is that, um, and I actually had somebody ask me about this the other day. I don't know how active you are on TikTok, but there's a TikTok trend of just all these jokes about eating pineapple, because pineapple is supposed to change the fa- flavor profile of certain yeah, things right. during sex. And so it's like, is that a real thing? Is it, or is that affecting our sex life in any sort of way? Or are we just like power eating pineapple because it's delicious? Okay, so I have my own, I have my own thoughts on this. <laughs> I've looked for the research. I get asked this all the time. I haven't found any research in support. I, I found like a couple studies that were inconclusive, but I haven't found any like anything supporting it. This is the way I feel about this. <clears throat> way more important than pineapple or asparagus or, you know, 
barley grass juice powder, you know, or like, what is it? Wheat grass juice is washing yourself. Like, I think that as far as any kind of flavor, <laughs> yeah. f- flavor <laughs> profile, that's going to make a way bigger impact than, <laughs> than any of these things. And I think it's like, if we're talking about like how big of a, you know, issue this is, I would say that's like the biggest bang for your buck. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a bath. Because like <laughs> we've all had experiences, you know, I mean, let's just be honest here. We've all had experiences um, where that may have been an issue. Like, you know, just, I think that's, that's your best bet. <laughs> that is solid <laughs> advice, whether or not you want to have good sex or not. Just <laughs> for everyone around you, please <laughs> wash all the parts. <laughs> So, like, how, how have you incorporated in this into your life personally after, like, learning all this and studying all this? I mean, do you just eat nothing but, like, leaves all day? <laughs> I know. I'm human. And I'm a foodie, too, on top of it. I try to, you know, I try to I try to incorporate, um, you know, healthy food into my diet. I always have. I, I always have made an effort to do that. Um, but, no, I what I try to do is I try to get a big – this is what I tell my patients, too. It's like – you know, some people are like, oh, I want to change everything. Okay, let's go. Let's go to town. You know, let's do everything. And then other people, or most, I would say, are like, okay, I don't want to throw my whole entire routine upside down. I don't want to be the person going to a party with a Tupperware container of salad that I brought with me, you know, instead of the food that they're serving. You know, um, we, we all get that. What, one really nice change that can be made with a minimal impact to our lifestyles is start maybe with lunch. You know, bring a big leafy green salad, bring a big DM, try to make it a routine on your work day, on your work week. And, you know, you're going to be getting a huge portion in that one meal. You'll be getting a huge portion of, um, you know, those, you know, the potassium that we talked about, magnesium, zinc, all those things that we've talked about how important they are. And, um, you know, that's that's a great thing you can do. You can also, you know, you can tweak other other, uh, you know, other meals. You have 23, 21 meals a week. And I feel like, you know, we should be enjoying our food for sure. Our bodies release dopamine when we eat and it's a pleasure chemical. It in food should be pleasurable. So, um, yeah, so, you know, just making changes that are reasonable and that feel right to you and you can go as big or as little as you want. So what have like studies shown or has there been research of, having somebody that doesn't have a diet like this and like kind of like studying the the quality in their opinion of sex and how their sex life is and then incorporating more of these foods and coming back like a period of time le- later and like tell me how your sex life oh is. yeah yeah there's lots of research on that so you know uh, the research i looked at for the book basically fo- focused on you know cl- clinical research epidemiological research um it like so for example in one study they uh, took type 2 diabetics. Now, type 2 diabetes is notorious for its sexual side effects. And the reason why is because, you know, it causes diabetic neuropathy. Excuse me. What it actually does is causes um, damage to nerve pathways. So you get um, slowed nerve conduction, you know, weaker, uh, slower signaling. And because of that, you get sexual side effects. Um, Type 2 diabetes is notorious for causing sexual side effects among males and females um, with inability to orgasm being one of the chief complaints among females and um, weaker, softer erections being one of the chief complaints among males. And so in several studies, what they did is supplemented antioxidants um, among type 2 diabetics who are experiencing sexual side effects and there were the two studies in particular that I'm thinking about. One of them, they supplemented with antioxidants. Then they actually measured how fast their nerves were firing and how strong they were. And they showed measurable improvements. And, and then in the other study, they actually measured um, sexual side effects. So they measured how easy it was for them to have um, orgasm, you know, sexual pleasure, sexual satisfaction, pre and post um, intervening with antioxidants. And so that was shown to be quite effective at, at improving that. So, well, you know, my female patients who come in, that's the biggest complaint. Well, there's actually the two, two biggest complaints among my female patients, low libido 
and difficulty achieving orgasm or it's taking them longer maybe than it used to. So that's one of the best ways that you can intervene. And yes, um, definitely research to show that it actually works. So is there any sort of timeline on that of how long it takes? It depends on your baseline, honestly. You can achieve, you can have some noticeable impact on sex in one meal, like the date night sex menu. Again, this is subtle, but it's <clears throat> it's not to be discounted, though. It's not going to be like a Viagra pill. But, for example, they, in one study, they gave participants um, one serving of spinach. And then, uh, so the, the chemical in your body that dilates blood vessels is called nitric oxide. And naturally um, high nitrate foods like spinach, beets, things like that, um, basically lead to an increase in nitric oxide. So basically that directly dilates blood vessels leading to better blood flow. So um, they gave participants one serving of spinach. Then they measured two hours later their salivary nitric oxide levels. And they found that they were eight times that of baseline. Hmm. So two hours eating, after eating one serving of spinach, nitric oxide was eight times what it was before. So that's a very significant um, effect with just one meal. Mm, that's awesome. But yeah, it is. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty, you know, impressive really. Um, but as far as, you know, my patients, it depends on their baseline as far as how often, how quickly um, we see results. Um, if I have a patient who comes in and is just starting to maybe notice that occasionally there's like softer erections, that sort of thing. It's a completely different picture than if I have a patient who comes in and says they haven't had a morning erection in, you know, three years or something. You know what I mean? It's just, mm -hmm. it's going to take a little bit more work to, um, to get things, you know, going right. I mean, I mean cardiovascular disease ha <clears throat> has always been thought of as being progressive and irreversible, meaning that all that plaque accumulation and, you know, the, the blood vessels of the penis and the clitoris are among the smallest in the body. What that means is that they get clogged first. So long before you see any signs of cardiovascular disease, you'll see sexual side effects like weaker erections, like reduced blood flow, you know, for females. So, um, you know, they, the, they're, this is something that just gets worse is how it's been thought of. But modern research has actually shown that there are, is, is that leafy greens actually have the capacity to reduce and remove some of that plaque accumulation. Not entirely. It's not like it can just get rid of all of it, but they've seen actually measured reductions with um, intervening with spinach, you know, just lots and lots of spinach. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. You know, shove those smoothies full of spinach. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So if somebody, you know, picks up your book and wants to read it, what other kind of topics can they expect out of the book? Well, you know, I had to throw, I could not talk about, you know, food and sex without talking a little bit about kindness in the bedroom because you can take really good care of your own body, make yourself great for sex. But if you're thinking just about yourself, you're not going to have great sex. So I really wanted to, um, I have a couple chapters on, um, you know, being a kind lover. And in, you know, that kind of vein, I included an entire chapter on uh, with a tutorial on oral sex. Because in my opinion, you can't say that you're a good lover until you know how to do that well. You know, so I have male oral sex, female oral sex um, in there. And um, so that's another kind of topic that you might not expect to find, you know, in a, a diet book, you know. That's where the washing in the pineapple comes in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if somebody was interested in buying your book, how do they how do they find you? And you said you have patients. Do you do one on one coaching or, or is it just the book? I don't I, I'm I treat patients with acupuncture. So okay. I, yeah, so I have a private practice um, here in Rochester. Um, but, um, if they want to find my book, it's on Amazon, it's diet for great sex. And, you know, speaking of TikTok, I do have a few, um, recipe videos on TikTok, diet for great sex and on Instagram at diet for great sex. Um, I also have a blog, um, where, you know, just, I write 
I write stuff. Um, it's at dietforgreatsex.com. So you said you mentioned you were in Rochester, so you're in Rochester, New York, which I know I do. I have listeners there, so if, if you're looking for an acupuncturist in Rochester. But I just have to bring up, since I lived in Rochester for four years, just how terrible is a garbage plate for your sex life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's going to be in the bad sex diet book. That's <laughs> Tastes good, but definitely not. And it's definitely like... Talk about the worst date night sex menu. That's oh, really bad. Not to mention the fact that most people, who, when they're eating a garbage plate, they've already been out drinking all night long yeah. because, <laughs> you know, they're going there at like two o'clock in the morning to get the garbage plate. So it's like you, you're like got the whiskey, you know, thing going on <laughs> yeah. and you got the garbage plate. <laughs> well, that's Plus just it tastes good. I feel like even any of that, just even like we're talking about the quality of food, it's also the quantity. Like if you're just eating like, you know, you're going to Chipotle and go into town before you're going to have sex. It's just like you just feel heavy. I mean, you know, I'm just bringing up Chipotle because it is a large amount of food, not because of the quality of the food, but it feels like that has to play a role into it too, not only of what you're eating, but if you're eating, you know, just a, a massive quantity of baked potatoes and, and right. bananas beforehand, you're also just kind of like, I'm not feeling very sexy right yeah, now. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, your body's, you know, uh, that, that, what you eat affects your hormones kind of immediately. So some of those are going to make you feel like just down and just kind of suppress everything, you know, and then other ones are going to kind of ramp you up. Well, Christine, this um, conversation was awesome. I'm definitely going to add way more spinach into my diet <laughs> and make sure I wash myself. <laughs> I appreciate your time so much. I'll have, um, you know, the book, the link for the book and your website all in the show notes. And, and thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. AmandaValentineBites.com.